All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you happen to be. My name is Christopher Harrison. This is Web Wednesday, and actually, this is the last Web Wednesday of 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 the of, of the calendar year. I'm really kind of sad about that, but uh, uh, we've got uh, uh, a slew of holidays that are coming up, uh, and so as a result, we're not going to be broadcasting uh, for the remainder of December or uh, for the remainder of, of November, but we are going to be broadcasting here for the next hour. So let's focus in on the good stuff. Let's focus in on the next hour. And I honestly can't think of a better way to close out our, our broadcast year uh, by, well, sort of just like bringing peanut butter and chocolate back together again, uh, bringing uh, John Galloway back on to chat about uh, .NET. Uh, for anybody who's not familiar, uh, John and I have done an awful lot of content together back in the uh, good old days with uh, MVA, did a lot on uh, like ASP.NET and uh, Entity Framework and, and so forth. And then John went on to like actually work with the .NET team and is working to help make uh, .NET better. And last week was a little conference, little conference, he says, called .NET Conf, where a lot of really cool announcements were made, a lot of new features were put out there, and uh, and we want to like just start to go through what uh, some of the cooler ones are and where you might want to maybe dig into as a web developer. But enough of me babbling here. Let's get John on to, uh, to start chatting here. So John, thanks for, thanks for joining. It's always fantastic to, to have you here. Yeah, thanks a bunch. I'm, uh, I'm honored to be uh, brought on to kind of wrap up the year with you. So. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I do miss, though, um, being able to, like, you know, hang out with you, like, actually here next to me and, and be able to do all of that good stuff. But uh, sadly... Next best thing. Yeah, yeah. Next best thing. And, and hopefully next year. Hopefully next year we'll be yeah. able to start doing this again. That would be, that would be really nice. Agreed. Agreed. Yep. You know, do yeah, the whole um... travel thing. As you're talking about, you know, kind of like ending the year, and we've we've really kind of, especially with .NET, but also like with Visual Studio, we've kind of settled into a kind of a yearly cycle now, where things ship in November, and then everyone at Microsoft goes on vacation all of December, basically. <laughs> <laughs> you get, which the, you get two groups of people. You get the people that are gone, and then you get all the people that are working because they can actually get something done. And it's pretty enjoyable to work when everyone else is on vacation. <laughs> That's actually my tack is I yeah. will uh, take like the first couple of weeks of December off because then everybody goes away for like Christmas and New Year's and Hanukkah and you know whatever other, other holidays you might have there towards the end of December. So everybody's gone. So I can get so much done. Um, it works out yeah. really well. So so that's 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 my trick. Uh, don't tell anybody, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, same here. I try and balance them, try and strategically go on vacation on the days where it's going to benefit you and then squeeze in a few days where you can just get your coffee and, you know, get something you've wanted to get done all year, you can actually focus. <laughs> it, it, exactly, exactly. I get so much done during that period when everybody is gone. It's, it's, uh, it's really one of the keys to my success here. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> So, yeah, well, so you mentioned .NET Conf, and that was that was a big thing. That was so .NET six uh, came out, and then as well as .NET six, all these other things that are kind of part of the whole .NET experience. You know, it's so all the the you know the underlying tools and frameworks, and then also the things that build on top of it, like you know EF Core and of course ASP.NET Core, um, and you know all, all the all the cool little um, bits and pieces. There's also a lot of things that don't get as much attention, but there's like, you know, YARP is a, is a reverse proxy for .NET, and there's um, there's uh, monitoring. There's there's all kinds of other things that all kind of boom, it's all out there. So, <laughs> so here it all is, and now we can all leave for the year. Um. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So um, just at, at a real quick high level, like what was um, .NET Conf for anybody who maybe hadn't heard about it or, or wound up missing it? Yeah, yeah, great question. So .NET Conf, it's a, um, it's a yearly uh, conference. It's a virtual conference. So there's in-person and uh, virtual 
um, with community speakers as well. So usually the first first day or two is uh, is Microsoft presentations mostly, and then after that we do a full 24 hours around the globe uh, presentations from community. And so we it's full 24 hours of live presentations. We have people speaking from just about every country, which is really pretty cool. And uh, and then after that, we have some in-person events. So I've got my my um, desktop here. If I can find my mouse. Oh, by the way, here's a cool new feature. If I hit, if I double click my escape button, I don't know. Yeah, that, that, that's a new feature in Windows Power Toys. Oh, no so, kidding. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so you double click your left control key and it focuses and then you can do your little spotlight. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so here's here's some of the stuff. The um, the session replays are live. Uh, I think they're still getting some of the third day in because there's 24 hours of, of content there. Um, there are virtual events going on around the world, which is pretty neat. So these are in-person events. Uh, and a lot of these are in different languages. They're in you know local languages. So like usually we'll get uh, tours through uh, through Asia, through South America, et cetera, in, you know, in people speaking natively in their own languages, which is so cool. Um, so tons of events going on. Um, what else? The slides and demos are up. So you can go over, this is a, a link to the repo and you can download the slides and, and get a lot of the demos here, which is pretty cool. So, so that's kind of the general deal is it, it's kind of the release party for .NET. And then it's a lot of short little sessions drilling in um, more in depth. So like uh, if we go into our session replays, you know, there are just tons of stuff up on YouTube and you can, you can, you know, go and watch them. And they're, they're, I'm, I uh, co-presented one session uh, on introduction to Razor Pages, Myra and I presented that. So, and they're, they're 30 minute sessions. So they're, you know, short little bite-sized pieces. Okay. All right. Yeah. Very cool. Now, I, I know that you just said you co-presented on Razor Pages, and, and if I was a, a good host, I would then take that as a cue to go, hey, let's talk a little bit about Razor Pages. But I'm not going to do that. Uh, instead, I'm going oh. to talk about what most interests me first, um, and that is minimal API. So uh, about a month or two ago, uh, we had uh, Maria Nagaga on to talk about uh, minimal API. And at that point, it was like just getting started. Like there was a little bit of, of like POC code that was available and you could do just like a couple of core things with it. Um, but at that moment, that was about it. Uh, but even still, just seeing that was enough to make me go, all right, this is interesting. So I know that there was like a bigger announcement around Minimal API. Uh, I'm going to work on hopefully getting Maria to come back on um, sometime next year to, to talk about Minimal API. But what is Minimal API and, and what was announced at .NET Conf? OK, well, let me show you the problem we're solving here. So and, and Maria and team have solved, which is really cool. So here is, let me see, I, I want to bring it, I've got multiple different projects open. So let me see if I can bring on the right one. Nope, okay, it's, it's hit and miss. Here is, <laughs> this is .NET 5. This is hello world in .NET 5, right? So I've got a program CS, which hosts the application. And then I've got a startup CS, and that does all this configuration and wire up and all this kind of stuff. And and like then, I already have a question here, which is 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 like, what's the difference then between program CS and startup CS? Because if I was going to create an application, like I, I I could see myself looking to create a class named either one of those as as the entry point. It, it's a great question. It's super confusing. Like I can tell. <laughs> I can make excuses for it because I was there when it was first getting kind of figured out. But to a new developer, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, so the idea here is program CS is it's just the host. And you normally won't change this. So this, so anytime you have code that's in file new project that you don't change, that sets off some warning flags for me. Like, why am I getting boilerplate code in every single project, right? Right. And then your startup CS is where you configure your application. So that's where you're going to say, here's what's here's where I'll wire up my database connections, and here's where I'll read my configuration and all that sort of stuff. 
So, but I'm doing all this before I'm actually even like doing much with my project. And then you'll see up at the top of the page, I've got tons of using statements, which as a .NET developer, I'm used to that, right? But to a new developer, it's kind of like, do I really need all that? And what does it even mean? What, like, why is it there? And I've got more of them here. And so it's just kind of a lot of stuff. Right. And so um, they actually have a really cool, where is it? They have a minimal API site. Um, it's just kind of a, a mini site. And here's the idea is, wouldn't it be great if this was Hello World? So I've just got three lines of code to do Hello World. And I can go and build on top of that, but I can start with three lines of code to host my app, right? <laughs> and I don't need all this boilerplate stuff. So, uh, so that's the general idea. And even as you start to kind of build up to a little bit more of an advanced application, see I've got an example here. I've got a lot of stuff open. So this is one where we actually are serving multiple endpoints and we're using a database. And the whole thing still is 57 lines of code. So this is a whole, uh, it has swagger, it has all this stuff, it's serving content. I think it runs, I'm pretty sure it does. Let's let's try. Uh, We're about to do a live demo here, folks. <laughs> yeah. So by the way, I just typed in .NET watch instead of, instead of .NET run. I, I noticed that. Net watch, yeah, so, so what's cool with that is it will run with hot reload um, and it'll watch my application and it, yeah, so if I change my code, it'll restart it. Um, but so here, now I'll go to my Swagger endpoints. So here I can say, here's a, a list of pizzas and I can go through and I can try it out and let's create a- Do you want to zoom in real quick? A couple of uh, control pluses. There we go, there we go, yep. All right, so here we're doing this and we'll do a pepperoni. And description is, um, and then we'll execute. <laughs> Hopefully it works. There it is. There we so go. we've created a pizza. And then if we go up here, we'll do get, and we'll get a list of pizzas. Right? And we, you know, all our kind of standard stuff. So what's neat here is that all that stuff is happening. And if I can find the one again. There it is. Just this code here. So That's... we've 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 done several things here. We've gotten rid of all the unnecessary using statements. All of these are here because they have some meaning, right? So I've got Open API, for instance. I'm I'm referencing my my uh, namespaces or my um, pizza model, and then I'm bringing in Entity Framework Core. And so I don't have a bunch of just random using statements. I also in this I don't need a namespace because what is the namespace even doing for me, right? And then I, with minimal APIs, they've got this kind of lightweight syntax on top of it. And we were chatting before the call, this feels more like a Python app, or it feels more like, you know, some of the lighter weight, like JavaScript frameworks. Yeah. So, uh, so, so yeah, so I've got this builder syntax, and then I can just go in and I can do this map get, map post. And, you know, like that's really all I need to do to get started. That feels it, it. That feels so much more natural to um, somebody who, like, I, I these days I spend a lot more of my time writing either Flask apps or or doing uh, like Node apps, and so that feels especially like that dot in this case map get. It would be just simply dot get or dot post if you were doing that in um, uh, in Node with like Express or Restify. So this just feels very natural to me as as that style of of a developer, and I also just think intuitively it just it it reads cleaner than uh, than in the past with like needing the attributes and and things like that yeah yeah and especially you know when we're doing something we're like hey I'm just learning or I'm just building so the two main cases that we um, and Maria's you know told me is two main use cases one is getting started like I'm just learning web dev and like .NET should be as easy to get started as any any other language out there. It should be as easy as you know Django, or it should be as easy as you know 
whatever node or something, right? And so that's one. And another is microservices. And if I'm if I'm building a microservice, I don't need all this other, maybe I'll use it someday sort of stuff, right? I, I wanna keep it light. And part of what's cool with this is it's built on top of the whole, like it's got the power of .NET, but it's stripped down. And so it's actually um, faster and, and smaller mm. um, for those microservice scenarios, so. And yeah. one of the one of the things that you had called out, which I, I definitely appreciate, is the the lack of ceremony. And I love that as it, it's just like a perfect word to describe like needing to go namespace wibble and then public class <laughs> something else and then public static void main. Like just yeah. having to put that in just to do um, like a hello world or just to do something you know uh, relatively trivial or relatively basic feels mm -hmm. like an awful lot of weight um, to go into that. So I appreciate that it's now just procedural, that it's it's simply, hey, this is what I want you to do, and then I don't need that static void main, that it will just figure it out from uh, from there. So I, I really appreciate that as I'm looking through it. Yeah, you know, I've had a few different responses to this. Some people are like, exactly like you're saying, like I've, I've had three. Some is from new developers, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, this just feels simple from existing you know, developers that have done .NET development before, it's divided. Some will say, super clean, love it, super light, and others will be like, oh no, you know, like this is gonna be a mess, it's gonna be, it's gonna turn into a 2000 line long program CS, right? But that's, that's not necessarily true at all. Like it just allows you to, decide when to refactor that code into other classes, when to, and, and so there's support for all those sorts of things. I could map these two things running in another class, right? right. Or I can map in controllers or something. Right. So, but I don't start with that to begin with. I think you made a, a really big point there about allowing flexibility. Like there's there's a time and a place for everything. And there's there's a time when I want to go ahead and break out like the Gang of Four Patterns book and I really need to start architecting um, everything that's there and and you know bring out my my inner Martin Fowler. But then there's a lot of times where I just need something really simple. Like I just need to, to get something up and running for, you know, maybe just a test or a POC or or like you mentioned, like I'm just learning this. And so let me just start doing things with it. Let me get a site that I can start to interact with. And if that's what I'm looking for, I don't need all the rest of that. I, I, I shouldn't need to have 15 classes just to create a relatively basic uh, site like the one that you've got with uh, with your pizza. Yeah, and I feel like that's that's really key. Like a few things that comes down to is what is the use case and what do you feel comfortable with? And so for this case, I've got I'm I'm it's CRUD. It basically it's a very lightweight API that's just adding things to a list and removing them and whatever. So if I'm pretty sure that's it and I need a microservice that does this, ship it, you know, this yeah. is good. And then also if I if I don't feel comfortable with this, I've still I'm still able to build MVC, Razor Pages, you know, more I'm still able to use those patterns if I like. Let me show you one other thing too, because the minimal API thing gets most of the attention, which which <laughs> you know makes sense. But you also have these minimal templates. So let me bring up <laughs> this is a um, a Razor Pages application. So what I want to show here is if you do, if you create a new Brazor Pages app, you still get this minimal, it's only 25 lines of code. So, so what's nice here is if I want a little more structure and I want things broken out either into MVC or into the Razor Pages pattern, then I can, I can do that. Um, but, I, but I still, I don't have to make a choice between super huge or super minimal. Like th this is pretty nice here. Um, this this is pretty simple, but here I've got it broken out. It says app.map razor pages, and then I'm able to use my standard razor pages pattern that I'm used to. Um, so this okay. works with MVC and razor pages as well. I so that, that that's pretty cool. 
Um, by the way, uh, real quick, for anybody who's not familiar with the abbreviation CRUD, C-R-U-D, John wasn't commenting on his code, um, but rather <laughs> create, retrieve, update, delete. So kind of the four yeah. main core database operations uh, that, uh, that that you would be making. So John's not being exactly. self-deprecating yeah. de self deprecating and talking about his code. Um, yeah, exactly. That create, read, update, delete. And that's um, you, those map over to here I've got you know, my HTTP verbs, and it maps pretty well to those. And those are actually, let me make a short little pitch here. In the minimal API repo, they have some tutorials, which are really nice. Um, so they go through and, and help you get started. And these, I, I recommend going through these. If you prefer a, um, if you prefer like the Microsoft Learn kind of format and you want to get your points and all that sort of stuff, we actually, uh, Chris Noring and I converted these over to Microsoft Learn modules. Oh, that's fantastic. So, yeah, so, so um, and these go through creating, you know, creating an application and then also, you know, uh, this shows you how to go through and like persist the data with any framework. And so it shows you hooking up SQLite and then the last one in the series uh, Chris did, which is converting to a React application. So this is using the API in the back end and then a React app on the front end. Oh, that's so. very cool. Do me a favor, if, uh, send me the, the, the link to that learning path and I'll, I'll get that, uh, that shared out in, uh, in the chat. So you can awesome. just shoot that to me in Teams and I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and get that, uh, get that shared out. I'll shoot it over right now. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So, so those, you know, those are kind of like the minimal approach to all of the templates and then the minimal APIs. Those are kind of a really big, uh, nice thing. And uh, like like we we're saying, it's it's great for getting started. It's great for even if you're a seasoned developer and you're just tired of all the noise. But if if it if you if you want that structure, you want more, you know, verbose code. <laughs> it's still all there. You can still do it. Still works. So. I do want to ask one real quick question um, about uh, web applications. So that's the big thing that uh, that I notice, um, like that that first uh, that first line of that web application dot create, um, mm -hmm. which again just feels very natural, like server dot create or something like that in um, in like yeah. Flask or, or otherwise. Um, my question is on that web application class: Is that just now globally available, or is there some other like little bit of magic that's making that available? Yeah. So you've got that web application dot create builder. Where is that web application class? Yeah. Okay. So there are some global usings, and let's see okay. if I I will probably not find it right, but there are some that are brought in by default into an application. So, so there's two neat things that that, um, that are available. One is you can create your own global usings, and then two is that there are some that are just kind of by default included just in creating a, a .NET six application. So, um, so so those are those are a few nice things. The global usings is really nice because it cleans up all this clutter. So I don't need to put at the top of every file. I don't need to bring in tons of different using system using this using that. Right. Uh, so yeah. Okay. And and then you can, and it's a balance. If you have a namespace that you only want to bring into one class, you can still put it at the top, like I've got here. Or if you want to add to your global usings, you can do that. Okay. So, All right. That um, makes sense. Yeah. Um, and one other thing that's kind of neat here is there's support for um, class level or, or um, what is it? class level namespaces. So here, for instance, I could do namespace like that. And so you'll see that more often too. Um, what's nice with that is then when you're refactoring, like I, I get these lines of code back again, so I don't have to nest it. So you'll see in, in the templates, you'll see that more often too. I, I, by the way, I wanna say, I, I always appreciate the fact that like all of your demos revolve around pizza. It's yeah, it's kind of a thing. I'm not sure. Uh, we we started with pizza, and I like this, by the way, because my pizza application actually looks really pretty. I'm not sure if this one. Oh, this one is just the API, but I've got another where we actually build a pizza app, and I use the pizza emoji up in the in the header, and I, I'm I'm pretty proud of that. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love it. 
do me a favor. Go real. Go back to the to the minimal API um, uh, app uh, real quick here. Uh, minimal API app. All yeah, right. re real quick. He says this. you've got like you know seventy windows open. I know it's my, it's kind of my thing. Uh, I think <laughs> it's this one here. Nope. Minimal, where are you? I, I will always <laughs> remember. Like, I, I think this is the first time it. we ever worked together. Um, and uh, I had looked over your shoulder, your your browser window, and you had like a million tabs open. And so I asked <laughs> you, like, how many yeah. tabs do you have open? You, you look at me and go, all of them. Well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think I might have closed it by now. Actually, let me see. Um, Let's do open recent, and it was, it's pizza store is the one I'm looking for. Yeah. And even this, oh, now my screen has gone out. I'm yeah. not sure what's ha <laughs> happening. All my screens just turned off for a second. Okay, I think they'll come back. Maybe your computer's just done for the year. It's mid-November, we're possible. good. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna close this one. Maybe it's upset because I've got too many Open, let me do open recent. I'm going to go to pizza store. That's it. I'm not sure if it's going to open or if it's if it's upset. Yeah, your video might also be frozen here. I can still hear you, but your video appears oh. to be frozen. At the should I, I wonder if I should stop my camera and restart it? I Let's try that. Don't, okay. <laughs> we'll give it a shot. Let's we'll see what happens. Okay. There we go. There we go. Okay. So you're moving okay. again. So that's 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 goodness. All right. Okay. So that's like half the battle. Let's see if we yeah. can't tackle the other half here. Let's see. Okay. I will stop and I'll reshare. <laughs> and da, 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 da. totally gonna work. Totally gonna work. I, I I have full faith. Did it work? Um. Yes, there we go. Okay. Okay, great. All right, cool, okay. cool, cool. So, um, so there was one other thing I wanted to show, which was the spa templates. Is that oh, cool? Um, actually, well, let's um, give me one second on that. I, I still want to go back to, okay. to, to, to the minimal code real quick. Okay. Um, so just because there's one, one, one last like so question that I had. I swear I'm not going to make this whole thing about minimal APIs. Well. I love talking about minimal APIs, so I'm a fan. <laughs> okay, here's the deal. I was getting confused because there it is. Here's my minimal, minimal API. Okay, perfect. Is that working? Yep, yeah. So my, my, my real quick question is on the like um, use Swagger, use Swagger doc, use Swagger UI. That, that was there in the past, correct? Or is that something that's also new with minimal APIs? It's a little bit smoother to hook up. Okay. So it's okay. it's part of the it's part it's an extension method on the builder or on the app, mm -hmm. um, which is nice. Um, but and I think some of that is brought in with this Microsoft Open API models. Okay. And then also in here we're bringing in the Swashbuckle ASP.NET Core. Okay. So, but some of the kind of goodness that that Maria, David Fowler, and team have hooked up and. and um, uh, uh, is is some of these extension methods that are just kind of some nice little syntactic sugar. So I don't need to, because the previous way you'd do it is you'd kind of, it was more like you had to know and think more about all these different things that you're pulling in and these dependencies and setting options on them and all that. Whereas with this, I can just say builder.services.this and app.use this. So. Right, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So I, I know that you're wanting to talk about uh, the, the, the new SPA templates. And for anybody who's not familiar, SPA is a single page application. Uh, and you know, that's typically where I've got you know, that React or, or Svelte or Vue or Svelte. I'm kind of revealing what my favorite front end framework is. <laughs> um, right. But it's, it's, it's that you've got that as your front end, and then you've got services as, as your back end. And the whole goal is that the user just interacts with that page much in the same way that they would interact with an app. Uh, so that the, uh, the, the browser doesn't, uh, the, the location URL doesn't necessarily update. I'm not using back. Like, I'm just interacting with it just like I would a, a mobile application or, or normal um, application. So uh, single page apps, you've got templates. Show us templates. 
I know you're yeah, really excited okay, about so it. Yeah, okay, so a few things. So the, you have a few options for that spa style. Um, one, of course, is Blazor, which is pretty slick. And that's um, there's there's both server side and then client side using WebAssembly. Um, the thing that's nice here, let me, I've got a slide that I've stolen from Javier's presentation on this. So the previous way we did it was your, your browser call would call into ASP.NET Core, which would proxy stuff back to Angular, and then Angular or, or React. And the, then those things would kind of forward them back through ASP.NET Core and back to the browser. Okay. And so some of the problems with that, and so we actually kind of hosted your Node application. So some of the problems with that was that it relied on us to update those templates. And it was a lot kind of more work for us to do that. It didn't interact. So most tutorials you'll find out on the internet when you go to like the Angular tutorials or React tutorials, they'll say, okay, do ng this or, or create React app that, you know? And so they're really focused on those, uh, on working with their tools. And we were kind of subverting all that because we were kind of, putting ourselves in, in charge of hosting things. So what they've done now is they've switched that around. So now uh, when you create your app, it basically, it'll pop, it hosts using, using Node, using that kind of for the front end, and then we'll kind of proxy stuff back into ASP.NET Core and back. So what that, what that means in practice is, here's, here's my application, I've got my program CS, Notice here too, right? I don't have 90 namespaces. This is still done using that kind of lightweight syntax. And it's just kind of, uh, it's it's doing this map fallback to file for index. And it's, it's, uh, it's kind of really lightweight. Um, so part of the reason that works is because, where's my, because we are hosting things and, we're, and your project file has all this stuff that's, calling it, it's basically when you're running your app it's saying like run npm install you know like run the npm stuff mm. so so this is kind of more like if you were a node developer and you were familiar with angular or react this is what you'd expect to work there so when i do dot net watch i'm training myself to always do dot net watch instead of dot net run um so what it'll do here is it'll actually spin up, uh, it'll spin up my ASP.NET page, and by default, my like file new project uh, homepage is going to say, "We launched your Node app, and uh, here's how to browse to it." And you'll notice here, it's popped open my uh, console, and it's got, it's doing the standard like npm things to run my front end. Okay. So, what what I notice when I've talked to like customers doing production, you know, ASP.NET Core on the back end and Angular or React on the front end, they were already doing this. They were ignoring those Angular and React templates that we shipped, and they were just doing this on their own. Right. Because they needed to kind of have this level of control. They're developing them kind of separately. So now when I go over to here, this is actually going to bring up my application. And it's it's not a broken demo. It's just taking some time because it's doing the NPM thing. It's standing up and doing all the stuff, right? But it's it's going to serve that application. And if I actually went over into here, oh, well, somewhere it's it's thinking about spewing a bunch of stuff down to the front end. So it's it's starting the app and it's getting ready to serve it, and it'll happen eventually. Okay. Well, while so. while it's doing its thing, let me um, I, let me ask. I'm trying to figure out which question I want to ask first. Um, go back to your code real quick. Um, yeah. So Brave Cobra asks the question um, about. Um, how the in how are the extension methods not just static controllers now? What's the benefit? That basically what he's saying is is that uh, when he's looking at minimal minimal API, he's not seeing a benefit for an enterprise application. I agree, honestly. For an enterprise okay. application, keep doing what you're doing, right? And I would want to break things out into controllers, etc. So okay. 
It, you can still do that with, with uh, minimal APIs, but it's on you to organize your code. Um, but so the, the main advantage you would see, even if you're an enterprise developer, is so not that, but if, if you go into, if I open back up like my pizzas, not that. This one, this is an example of, this is a Razor Pages application. So I've got my code now broken out into pages. I've got my page model. I'm able to kind of keep that level of separation. So the, the clearest way I think about difference between MVC and Razor Pages, uh, MVC separates by controllers, models, and views, and Razor Pages separates things by feature. So mm. here, if I've got a pizza, now I've got a pizza and pizzas, uh, my view code, and that's kind of all kept together. So, but I've got all my organization here that I want, but then as far as my kind of startup code, I don't have a bunch of clutter here. So enterprise application, I would look more like, you know, at this sort of thing. And, and you know, as a, as a reminder, like we run the .NET website off of Razor Pages. Like it's Razor Pages and Blazor, but it's serving, you know, like millions of hits a month. Um, here's a page I coded up recently, which I'm, kind of proud of I, I get to contribute code event or occasionally so here's a page that, that i hooked up you know and it's it's hitting a back end and hitting functions and doing all this stuff and and i'm um, so able to do this all using razor pages so okay let's cool. see if this is ready yet i've got high hopes to new local host yay so there's my angular application right so the, the point with that is that I have access to, like if I'm a React or an Angular developer and I'm like, hey, maybe I wanna use ASP.NET Core, I can do it without totally leaving the ecosystem that I'm used to. <laughs> and also if I am, you know, it, even if I'm not, you know, super in either of those worlds, if I go and read the docs for Angular or React, they're going to look more like this, right? And so it's a lot easier to go in and, and be an Angular or React dev and work against an ASP.NET Core backend, and it's it's going to feel more natural. Right. Okay. That uh, that makes sense. I do have a question, though, on, on that Angular app, because I noticed, or maybe I missed it, there wasn't a package JSON file. So if I was going to be adding in other dependencies, or is there a package JSON file and I'm just not uh, not seeing if, I, if I'm going to it's add hidden. other dependencies, how do I do it? Yep. Okay. So let me see. It is in client app. So, oh, okay. So yeah. So that's what's going on there, and that that is an excellent oh. question. So what's nice here is if I want to do my Angular dev stuff, it's all here, right? And I can go in and I can. I can change it around without, so they actually kind of live almost in two separate worlds, right? So my ASP.NET core host and whatever kind of services and things I want to supply there can be ASP.NET and then any kind of Angular stuff that I want to do, it's all here, right? So. Okay, so, all right. Yeah, so that's the goodness there. And so I can go in and I can configure everything you know, so I'm not kind of like, it's not hidden, it's not abstracted in a way that I can't get to it. Right. No, I, yeah. I, I appreciate that. And I actually kind of like the fact that that's like over here in, in, in a separate folder away from, from everything else, kind of keeping all of that, uh, all of that separate. So Exactly. So, yeah. so Angular doesn't even need to know that ASP.NET Core exists. And the ASP.NET Core is doing its, it, as much as it can to kind of stay out of the way as well, too. Okay. So. So if I want yeah. to swap it out with Svelte, then I can just go ahead and... You totally could. And <laughs> so there, we don't ship a template for that, but um, I had Javier on the ASP.NET Community Standup kind of recently, and he talked about that they had done a prototype uh, with something, I, I forget if it was Svelte, but it was it was swapping in another spa framework, and they're like, it's it's relatively easy to do. because Because they've set things up that it's, they're kind of separated out now. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna get to Razor Pages in 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 a moment here, and 
this is uh, potentially a little bit of, of a tangent, um, but the question has come up from uh, Brave Cobra again, is how can I get my console application to return its exit code? The compiler generated main method returns void. Uh, should I just put the old back uh, in every time that they create a brand new console app? Uh, let me see, you know, so if it's just a console app, not a web app, and they're trying to get console app put, yeah, you should be able to just return return your exit code. So then, so um, just get rid of the void and just put in int and then return the exit code. That should work. Okay. I have not looked at that. I I, I wouldn't promise, but that was that's what I would do. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Yeah. Um, so at the very beginning of all of this, until I hijacked the conversation uh, to talk about things that I wanted to talk about, uh, Razor Pages. Don't get me wrong, I do want to talk about Razor Pages as well. But you said that there's been some updates in Razor Pages as well. Oh yeah, so and it's less, you know, it gets less attention, but some of the neat stuff. As so, this is the the blog post that the the team put out. Um, so some of the top things: hot reload applies everywhere. And what's really cool with that, we we had .NET Watch before, but what, what .NET Watch would do is restart your application when you changed a file. And the problem with that is I'm, it's, you've got to wait for the whole application to restart. Maybe I'm halfway through filling out a form or something, I lose my application state. So with, with Hot Reload now, it's actually injecting those changes into the application and just updating on the fly. So that's super cool. Um, then uh, those minimal templates is another thing. One other thing that I love is the support for CSS isolation. So what that allows me to do is I can create, so say I've got an index page and it's got, it's got index, here, let me see if I can get this to be zoomed enough. So I could create an index.cshtml.css. And then I can create styles that are just specific to that page. And so that, what I've done with, in order to support this in the past is I'll go through and I'll put something in the head of my layout that on every single page set, creates a unique class for that page, right? And, or, or an ID for each page. And then my CSS is really complicated because it says only use this for this and this. So here I can create, uh, styles that only apply to you know each page and you do have to do one important thing every i have forgotten to do this in the past and i'm like why is this not working you do need to in your style sheet you need to say or in your layout you need to say you need to add a reference to the assembly name dot styles dot css okay and then once you do that it brings all of them in so Okay. Um, so, so yeah, that's really kind of a handy thing. And then one other thing that's just always going on is uh, it's just faster, right? So if you're building Razor Pages or MVC applications, so for instance, here's the MVC five, uh, which was already pretty fast. So this was uh, the uh, Tech and Power benchmarks, and I'm looking at the fortunes, and uh, so there's. We started with plain text, and plain text is nice, but it's not real world at all, right? Because it's just, it's returning a, t a text string. Um, so it's, it's not really doing something all that useful. The Fortune's benchmark is actually going in and um, it's like doing database updates and stuff. So here's where we were, you know, here's um, 411,000 uh, responses, and if, if you look at the latest now, we're looking more 450. Now this looks kind of incremental, but if I bring up the, what they actually talked about at .NET Conf. So this, this was the thing that they showed was up to a 92% improvement. And this is because of in, in any framework core performance. So really what, what, um, what we're seeing there is if you look at web benchmarks, there's the very easy, simple ones where you're just, you're, you're doing basically nothing. You're pinging an endpoint and it's returning text. And that's, that's cool and it does prove out that you've got a fast stack, but as soon as you start adding data 
and JSON and that sort of stuff, it can really slow things down. So, and, and this is, it has this big preliminary data. I'm looking at the kind of like nightly uh, updates or the continuous run updates for Tech Empower. But it's pretty cool to see like ASP.NET Core, and this is with Postgres, and it's in the top 10, like across the board, which is, which is pretty awesome. Um, and, and this includes things like JSON serialization, um, it includes things like you know your your data updates, your multiple updates, and all that sort of stuff. So, I those are pretty cool. And so th there's the uh, EF core stuff, which is big. But another thing that people don't think about is JSON serialization and basically dealing with JSON. And so let me see if I've got. I think I've got that in here. JSON. Whoops. Okay. So there's a thing called source generators in .NET, uh, in .NET in general, and they've made more use of them in .NET 6. What source generators are, they're super awesome. They basically can build code based on different files and different, different information in your application. So what, what's happened in the past is, uh, JSON serialization, deserialization had to be really careful because it had to like check for special cases. It had to parse through your JSON. It had to look at, you know, figure out what what your things are. With source generators, it can basically, as you're compiling your application, it can look at your attributes or it can look at JSON and it can say, oh, I will build you a custom serializer or deserializer. And so as a result of that, um, so you know, here's an example, and then it'll go through and it'll actually build custom serializers, deserializers, and then they, they've got benchmarks in here, but it's basically gets way faster. So a lot of just kind of things where you're like, you wouldn't really think about it, but they're super important when you're actually building an application and trying to make it run fast, so. I dig it, okay. Yeah. All right. The, there's one other thing that, that I just, like it's a whole other topic, but Blazor, <laughs> yes, uh, is the Blazor updates are pretty insane, and you'll you'll see there's a ton of them listed. We in got about here. 13 minutes left, so plenty of time. So talk about Blazor. So so Blazor has some crazy things, including support for uh, native dependencies, and so Steve Sanderson did an application. Uh, I don't. I think I have it running. I don't have it running, but I can show the general idea. He built an app and I totally recommend take 30 minutes and watch his demo. It's it's one of the most fantastic like presentations I've seen him. Every time I watch Steve Sanderson talk, I'm just my mind is blown. Um, but he he in half an hour shows find it on here. Uh, this one here. So uh, yes. <clears throat> so he builds an app and he embeds. Uh, no, that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Steve Sanderson talk. I'll get you the okay. link to it. But but uh, what he does is he embeds SQLite in a Blazor WebAssembly application. And what that allows doing, I'm trying to drag this over. Uh, what that allows doing is client side synchronization and offline with a PWA. So basically, he builds a PWA that's reading from data. By the and way, then he's anybody who's not familiar with PWA, PWA is a progressive web app, um, and it, to a certain extent, sort of like allows you to install it locally. I'm using that word install uh, rather loosely there, um, but it can mm -hmm. then behave much more similar to an actually like locally installed app than a uh, than than a web app. Um, and like personally, I use um, Outlook Web Access. Um, as a PWA, I, I honestly don't. I, I, I don't use Outlook. I use um, uh, OA as a uh, as a PWA. So for anybody who's not familiar, um, PWAs they're they're really cool. It's 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 awesome, and PWAs have support. Like you can run them. They look like an application. Uh, they can also have. Uh, they can work offline, and they can have support for offline storage, and. So a lot of the time people will use uh, local storage in the browser, which is okay, but it's not, it's not super fast and it's, not, it's, it's harder to work with than something like Kennedy Framework. And so what Steve shows in this app is he is actually bringing, he's using Inscripten, he's compiled SQLite 
to to WebAssembly, and then he's actually doing live queries in the application. And so what's what's amazing with this is when you run the app, you can do filters, you can do queries and all this stuff, and it's immediate because it's all the data is actually in the browser. So I, I just want to pause and, and restate what you just said there is he's running SQLite in the browser. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's nuts. So and and so he's got SQLite, and then he also shows here's a REST dependency, and so he's compiled REST to to WebAssembly running that in the browser. So that's cool, but that's something that's I would be less likely to use. Running SQLite in the browser is like that's a game changer, <laughs> right? Because I can run like I I can synchronize that data when I'm online, but if I'm offline, or even if I just want my app to run really fast, I can do sorting and querying and filtering, and it's instant. So it's it's uh, it's pretty amazing. So so that is that is an example. Um, they also another neat thing they did is they they make it possible to expose Blazor components as web components, and that means you can use them in a React or Angular or Svelte or whatever application as well. Um, so so that's that's pretty slick to be able to do that. What's nice with that is I can make a I don't have to make an all or nothing decision with my application, right? So I don't have to say, oh, we've got to migrate this app from Angular to React, or I've got or excuse me, from Angular to Blazor, right? I can say, no, I'll just build this one component in Blazor, and then I'm going to include it as a React component. So I don't know if that that totally makes sense, but it's it's pretty wild to be able to do that. So you can just uh, in, include a React component then inside of your Blaze app. You can you uh, the, you probably could, but what he's showing is the other way around. Okay. Including oh, interesting. a Blazor component in a React application. Huh. So yeah, huh. and so you know a reason you do that is if you had something where you actually wanted you wanted performance what and. As part of that too, they have support for AOT comp or um, compilation. So, so what that means is you can comp compile in order to get that really uh, fast performance. And uh, and again, he shows in his application or in his demo, creating something that's got like a live animation. And when it's AOT compiled, it's crazy fast. So, see now now I'm kind of of. Of interest, you probably don't know know the answer to this, but so I, I can pull a Blazor component into a React app. Am I able to then like interact with it? So can I then like get events out of it, or can I make calls into it? Or like more specifically, if that Blazor app is then hosting SQLite, could I then from React be able to through that that browser component or to that Blazor component be able to use SQLite? Yes, and that is a, a a really good question. And so, yeah, and he does show how to do that. And it's basically you're able to pass parameters. So he's got a React application that's got a search bar in the header, and you type content, you type your search filter into that, and it passes that information into the Blazor application. And the two work back and forth, and it's just it's working as a standard web component. So that pretty wild to that, be able to do that. So <laughs> yeah. I, I think this is the link in here to the docs. Yeah, so basically you register a Blazor application. So here, this would be a Blazor app or a Blazor counter component. Okay. And you just basically say register that. And then you can, after you've done that, you can just inject it into, um, into an, or you can use it in a React application. I That's... think, it, so it's, it's. I would have to kind of fumble around to find the the source code for it. I just recommend take, if I if I could basically say nothing else about it, take a half hour and watch Steve's uh, Steve's demo because it's crazy. That's really cool. I'm I'm definitely definitely gonna have to go check that out. So uh, yeah, yep, yeah. Yeah. Um, Brave Corbeus, is that using JSON or app? Uh, I don't think. Uh, yeah, actually, I. Oh gosh, I forget. That's all right. I, I, I didn't mean forget. to put you on the spot. It's all good. Yeah, it's all good. It's all good. Cool. Um, we got about five minutes left here. Probably four minutes uh, left. 
Um, any other like really neat, oh, I really want to be able to show this off. Uh, okay, so there's one thing, and let me see if I can, I'm gonna need to bring this up. We do have a, a Learn Live. Oh yeah. Uh, so web, I think it's called Modern Web. So I'm, I'm Googling it in my other window, here it is. Modern Web Development with .NET 6. So this is a series we're doing on Learn Live. And <clears throat> we did one starting on Monday, uh, Scott Hanselman and, and Myra Wenzel were, were teaching this, and uh, I was in the background helping to moderate it. So we've got um, we've got these going out, I think, every week for for the next several weeks. And so you know, it's 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 me and my friends, and we're we're showing all kinds of cool stuff with modern web dev, and that includes uh, you know microservices and APIs and backend stuff. So. That is really cool. Um, shoot me the, um, the the link to that, and I'll get that uh, that shared out. For anybody who's not familiar with Learn Live, uh, basically what this is is it will be experts like like John or Scott or or uh, Myra or otherwise that will uh, walk through um, a Learn module, and they'll be able to answer questions to then help offer you support as you're going through it uh, on your own. So uh, it's uh, yeah. it's a pretty neat way to uh, explore, and it's also a great opportunity to get in and ask questions as well. So um, yeah, and Code with Sean yes. uh, says microservices and his ears perked up, so yeah. Oh, cool. yeah, oh, it's Sean. yep, hey, Sean, nice to see you. Um, so I, as an example, we went through this one on Monday. This was one that, this is a learn module that I wrote and I got to watch Scott Hanselman do it live. And I got to see anywhere that my instructions were unclear. Yeah. Uh, because he would like say, hey, it's not working. This has got to get fixed. So, um, so, so as an example, we go through and create an application. And in this one, these, uh, we've been working frantically, you know, to get all these updated. So for instance, this one is using .NET 6. So you'll see as you create your application, it'll show uh, building out an app using you know the new patterns with with uh, .NET six too. Very cool. Um, yeah. I'm also now battling the same issue that you are in trying to find all of my my windows since we like broadcast to a couple of different spots. I've got like a million different <laughs> chat windows open. Um, there we go. Um, cool. Well. John, thank you so much for, for, for joining. Thank you for, for showing all of this off. This is like the, the perfect way, I think, to, uh, to, to close out the year. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I'm honestly like, I'm trying to wrap my head around all the stuff because we had Ignite, we had Visual Studio launch, and we had .NET Conf, and there's so much new stuff. I feel like my head's exploding. And so this is helpful for me to try and at least make it into a list that fits into about an hour. <laughs> so there's a lot of new stuff. Perfect. Um, well, we're going to have to to find a way to bring you back um, early next year, which I'm I'm sure we will. Uh, we are going to be back that first Wednesday of January, and uh, we're going to actually do two weeks of CSS because if you're anything like me, and I know I am, I could certainly use some improvement to my CSS skills. So we're going to actually bring on a, a couple of fantastic people to get in and talk about CSS. So definitely uh, come back and check those out, and then outside of that, uh, enjoy whatever holiday it is that, uh, that, that you celebrate and uh, stay safe and thanks for tuning in and thank you again to John. Thank you. Bye.